Let us pray. Merciful Lord, absolve your people from their offences, that through your bountiful goodness we may all be delivered from the chains of those sins which by our frailty we have committed. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our blessed Lord and Saviour, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. God, whose blessed Son, our Saviour, gave his back to the smiters and did not hide his face from shame, give us grace to endure the sufferings of this present time with sure confidence in the glory that shall be revealed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that belonged to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, 
How many of my father's hired hands have read enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he went off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Thanks be to God.
all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them a parable. Well, I'm not going to rehash that parable. You know it. The prodigal son. Or, if you want to be a bit more sophisticated, the forgiving father. Or the parable of their sons and their father. Or perhaps the parable of the grumpy older brother. You've heard so many parables about, sermons about it, that you don't need me giving you another sermon explaining a story that doesn't really need explanation. So today I thought I would do something a little bit different. Let's look at the three main actors within the story as states of our being, as spiritual beings, as Christians whose lives are being transformed by Christ, who are seeking to find our identity in Christ. I'll deal with the Father last, but I want to think of these three as aspects of our own reality, our inner reality, and what, as Christians, we actually need to deal with in order to find a maturity in Christ. Let's start with the grumpy older brother. For me, he represents a very important aspect of life, and this is the desire to be good. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be good. But as you listen to the story, you realize that he is very angry and he has sought to do everything right for his father. He's never asked for anything. See, within us, there is this desire to be good and this desire to be good can be a fatal thing in Christians as individuals and as community, as church. Our desire to be good to be seen to be good, to seem to be good, uh, doesn't give us permission to be real and honest about who we are. One of the biggest issues in Christianity is what's called niceness. Nice people don't get angry. Nice people forgive others. Nice people are only capable of doing nice things. And so that niceness in Christianity is a basically a ticking time bomb because if it isn't dealt with, what it does is it creates a mask. And that mask becomes more and more alienated from the reality of what's going in us. We've all probably been in situations where we've had to pretend to be happy or we've had to pretend to be nice. I heard it said that um, children learn very early on to hide their emotions, so they don't show on their face what they really think. It's actually a natural and good part of growing up. You don't immediately show to someone that you are angry with them or disappointed in them, when someone gives you a present, of course, you say how much you like it. And we teach children that it's important to say thank you and smile when we're given a present. All of this is part of just learning how to be human. But of course, just behind all of that can become a almost pathological need to be accepted, to be seen as being good and kind. This need is actually quite a dangerous thing for us because it means that we will then hide what's going on, the pain in us. When this goes wrong, we will often end up in a situation where we might explode or we might, in fact, become quite manipulative. There's a relationship here with the idea of being frustrated, frustrated at many levels. At a, at a very deep level of our being, frustrated with who we are and what we're getting. And because we've learned not to be too honest about what's going on, we lose the ability to, in fact, show what is there. Human beings have a tendency, and uh, 
in some circumstances, to become very manipulative. Um, I can't express what I need, and so what I will do then is do something to get you to do what I want you to do. Or I will put the guilt onto you because you're not doing what I think you should do. Or more commonly, Christians can become very judgmental. I don't know if you've ever found yourself becoming judgmental at other people um, because you don't like the way they're dealing with stuff. See, this represents one state of being for us as, as human beings and as Christians particular, because we try to be good so that we are acceptable. In theology, of course, there is a long history, you can read St. Paul's epistles, uh, about the fact that God loves us, just loves us. And this should give us a sense of freedom and hopefulness. But because we, at some level, are frightened of God not loving us, or the consequences of God not loving us, we then mask it with a desire to be good. We've seen so many examples of how terrible it is in the church when Christians act in ways that have been, um, as an organisation, when we protect our reputation, for example, we say, um, we don't want people to know that uh, sins of a sexual nature have happened, or now, if sins of a sexual nature happen, we completely blank out that person and what they've done. But we really then ask the question, what's happening that causes this sort of behaviour? Now, when we look at the younger son, we do see that incredibly rebellious nature. And it's that part of us that actually needs to break free. Often, there are times in our lives when we need to discover who we are. I suspect this has become a very real thing in the Western world and in the world as influenced in the Western world for the past 100 to 150 years. Who am I? I want to be free. Uh, I want these chains to come off. I, I need to stand strong. Rebelliousness is a very interesting concept within us because when we examine our own rebelliousness, we will find that there is something going on that is quite unresolved. It could be a searching for who we are and where we need to go, but there is a process going on which we need to deal with. An unexamined rebelliousness can be quite destructive. Our rebelliousness could be due to many factors. One of the things I've become aware of when I look at all sorts of issues within the world in which I live as a parish priest, uh, those within my community and those outside of the community, is how so many of the behaviours that are self-destructive are based on unexamined aspects of the psyche. And this unexamined behaviour or the inability to resolve what's trying to be examined means that we often will act out in ways that seem perfectly reasonable but aren't. Although I won't get into the discussion of it, sometime here, sometimes the rebelliousness is sanctified as good and necessary without then sitting with where does this rebelliousness come from. I know that when I've dealt with people who live on the streets or with drug addicts, or various other form of addicts, or people who are acting out in other ways, spending enough time with them will often show me the, the deep levels of pain within them, and the, um, the, uh, the abuse or the, um, the suffering that has gone on. Then finally, I want to think about the father image. See, the father who, who very in a sense, although he runs to meet the, rebel, the rebellious son and he goes out to meet the older son, the father is a, a still point. And for me, I want to just suggest that he might represent to you the 
two sides, the, the rebel and the unexamined good person, they're both forms of rebellion, actually being resolved and integrated. Um, in spirituality, the important thing is to learn how to rest in God. And resting in God means that unlike the older one, we take away the masks slowly and become real. And unlike the younger one, we start to face the pain and come to integrate it into who we are. We actually start a process, a lifelong process, of resolving that pain that has caused the rebellion and seeing what it generates. Just to talk very briefly about the story, the favourite line in mine, in, for me, uh, are when um, the older brother says to the father, this son of yours, and the father replies to him, this brother of yours. And it's the way in which we allow who we are and what we have been and what is in fact causing us enormous anguish to come to the surface and be integrated and accepted and made new. When Christ goes to the cross, what we see is the one who, as the Son of God, accepts the human condition, it's all its frailty, and starts to hold it into himself. And as he holds it into himself, it's giving us the way forward so that we in Christ are transformed. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about um, be reconciled, um, that we in fact must be agents and ambassadors of reconciliation. And this reconciliation must start with this process whereby the various aspects of our own psyches are resolved and find, find their coherence in Christ Jesus. And then this allows us to be the, the center of a stillness and a godliness that is both honest and truthful and yet ultimately safe and embracing so that others who are on their journey may find in us the image of Christ reconciling the world to himself and we then become agents of that reconciliation. This is just some thoughts to stimulate your thinking about the prodigal son story and other aspects of your spiritual journey. And I hope that what I've given you is not answers, but possible launching pads for you to think about the things I've been talking about and where the Holy Spirit leads you. Oh
who from the death of sin raised you to new life in Christ, keep you from falling and set you in the presence of his glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>